Hello, everyone. Welcome back to everyone at COP26 and at our hubs and also those watching virtually online. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Innall from SAMS, who's going to lead a discussion on the Atlantic overturning circulation and its stability under climate change. Take it away, Mark. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone. I just uh, kept my mask on. For, I'm very chuffed. I've got the Nicola Sturgeon mask today, so I'm pretty pleased with that. But I shall take it off for speaking. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, pleasure to in, uh, in, uh, welcome you to the zone here. I've got a full house here, which is great. Uh, welcome to people online as a camera. Um, and welcome to people after the event who watched this recorded. I uh, hope there are a few of them. Welcome to my final year students if you're watching on a Saturday morning. I hope you are. Um, okay, so the purpose of this session today is we're going to look at... We had in the previous session, for those of you who were here, about how interconnected the whole global ocean is. We're going to focus in today on the Atlantic and its direct effect on the Arctic Ocean. We're going to think about the fragility, complexity, and particularly the uncertainty surrounding change in the Arctic. Um, and for that, we have to look at the whole Atlantic Ocean. We have to think about the way uh, heat comes in around South Africa into the Atlantic Ocean, into the South Atlantic Ocean, how it then moves up into the North Atlantic Ocean and into the Arctic. It's a connected system. I don't really think of the Arctic as separate from the Atlantic. So we need to think of it as a whole system. We've got a real eclectic mix of uh, things for you today. We've got uh, an introduction from our, um, the chair of the Scottish Science Advisory Council. I'll show uh, a two minute introduction from Professor Maggie Gill in a second. We've then got a fabulous half hour movie um, film from uh, director Michael Schneider, who's in the audience, who will introduce the film. So I really invite you to get in the groove, get into the mood of a half hour film. And then we'll go in to have some short presentations discussing the complexity of the science, the complexity of some of the policy related issues and the complexity of the biological ecosystems associated with the Arctic Ocean. And then we'll have a Q&A panel session at the end. So there will be polar bears, not just on my socks, uh, there'll be some polar bears because you've seen the penguins already. So we're going to move on to polar bears. <laughs> anyway, I shall start just by showing a two minute intro from Professor Maggie Gill. Um, I have to get manual advance here. A little bit of tech trouble. Here we go. My name is Maggie Gill, and I am privileged to be the chair of the Scottish Science Advisory The Council was established by the Scottish Government to provide objective and independent advice. Okay, I think what we might do in the interests of time. We will invite, I'll invite Michael to come up on stage now. I think I'll show um, Maggie's introduction after the screening of Michael's film. So a pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Schneider onto stage now, who's the director of Into the Dark. And that'll be followed by a full screening of the film. So I, this is different from uh, the rapid fire information and discussion we've had up until now. This is an opportunity for you to enjoy your Saturday morning uh, and watch a full-length uh, documentary film about the fragility of the Arctic. Michael. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me and thanks for being here. My name is Mike Snyder. I'm a photographer and I'm a filmmaker and I'm the director of Into the Dark. Uh, and I'm a, a climate scientist by, by training. And I now run a production company that makes films really with the goal of raising scientific literacy and trying to drive impact around environmental issues. Uh, and, and I made this transition from uh, science to visual storytelling because as a graduate student, I was overwhelmed by the amount that we already know 
about climate science and all the tools we have to resolve this issue. Uh, and despite that, particularly at the time that I was studying, just how little uh, we were doing. So I fundamentally believe we have to tell better stories about who we are and why we're here and how to be good stewards uh, of this planet. So, so for the films that I make, that's my core, core goal, is that they're somehow more than pretty pictures. Right? They're somehow more than entertainment. They're also a call to, a call to action. Um, and so even though I hope, you, I hope you enjoy the film, I hope, it's a, I hope it's a good film, an entertaining film to watch, I hope it's something more than that for you. Uh, so finally, I'd just like to say, in particular to the folks that are here doing that work, that are here working uh, at the conference, thank you so much for that work. Thank you for being here. Uh, and please, I implore you to, to get it done. Uh, I fundamentally believe this is the call of our generation and, and now is the time. So I have to have hope that we're going to see it through. So thank you so much for that work. And I do hope that you enjoy the film. Thanks. While we get the film running, ah, here it comes.
Jones, Todd Day, Todd Day, and 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 Todd Day, and
So one of the big impacts of this high latitude warming is that sea ice has reduced by 30% in the Arctic and it is projected to be absent by 2100. So this, can, this exposes the dark ocean to absorbing solar energy and so that will continue to accelerate global warming. So the current pattern is, will we see a continuing change, a pattern amplification of this? So continued global warming at a steady rate, proportional to the atmospheric CO2 concentrations, will it just be reflected as a pattern amplification of this type of warming situation? But there are low probability, high impact events tipping points in the climate system that can make changes happen much more rapidly than the forcing is occurring. And this plot shows uh, a recent result from the UK Met Office climate model where they artificially halt the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation by adding fresh water to the North Atlantic. And the overturning is carrying heat northwards. And if you switch off by triggering this feedback in the climate system, you see a rather abrupt cooling over the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. Over the UK, for example, temperatures would be forecast to drop by five degrees centigrade. And as Mark said, um, we know that the IPCC say there is only a medium likelihood that this could occur. So it's not a low likelihood. I mean, we just don't have enough knowledge. But we do know that in the past climate record, these abrupt changes have happened many times before. And in fact, in the recent past, about 8,200 years ago, after we had come out of the last ice age, an ice dam burst in uh, hope where all the meltwater was being held back and the Atlantic was abruptly flooded with fresh water. And that basically switched off this Atlantic circulation and led to a rather rapid and abrupt and extensive cooling throughout the Northern Hemisphere North America, Europe, and, and in Asia. So what is it about the Atlantic circulation that's driving that? This is a, a really nice map. You've seen it uh, a few times in the last session. And what I like about it is it's really focusing on the ocean. And, and in particular, it shows how the Arctic Ocean is connected through the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific and Indian via the Southern Ocean. Okay. And in the blue and red lines, we have this thing called the conveyor belt, which you will have heard about. And the red lines, especially focusing on the North Atlantic, is warm water moving all the way north through the uh, Atlantic into the Arctic. And then the blue line is the cold, deep water returning south. And it's this circulation that is affecting the heat transport that's giving us our current climate. But the connection between the red upper limb and the blue lower limb happens in special places. So in the Arctic Ocean and in that region between Greenland and Scotland, they're particularly important regions where warm water is converted into deep water. But that is being impacted by Greenland melt, by sea ice melt, and by increasing river flows, flows from the Eurasian rivers. And fresh water makes it much harder to convert upper ocean water to the deep water. And at the moment, this excess of fresh water is being taken out of the Atlantic and the Arctic system by this global conveyor belt, and it's being exported to the global ocean. But there comes a point when the Atlantic is not, no longer exporting enough of the excess fresh water, melt water, that it just stops the circulation and you can drive the, the climate into one of these tipping points. So that's a feedback in the climate system. Now, we're going to have a quick look at a movie. This is some research that's being done in Scotland to try and understand these complex feedbacks between Greenland ice in particular and the Atlantic Ocean circulation. And this is going to show a state-of-the-art computer model um, of Atlantic water entering a fjord, melting the fjord, and the fresh water feeding back into the Atlantic circulation. Hi, I'm Neil Fraser, an oceanographer at SAMS. In this video, we'll explore video, how ocean dynamics can drive ocean warm water into Arctic fjords, where it accelerates the melting of glaciers and sea ice.
This is a simulation of kangaroo slap. 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 Here we can see warm water flowing towards the end of the world, or 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 end of the world. And now we can see the interface between this warm water and the cold or fresher water. It's waves in this interface that pump warm water into the water. From this perspective, we can see how strong winds drive very large, drive very large, drive very large. We therefore get strong currents in the fjord whenever we have stormy weather. The warm water flows right to the end of the fjord, to the left of the picture here, where it comes into direct contact with the glacier face but below the surface. This means significant melting can occur during the winter when winds are stronger. Similar processes occur Similar in Svalbard, where changes, Svalbard, changes in the wind patterns will like increase warm water entry. Information. I don't know if we're making uh, the versions of our talks available afterwards, but there are narrated versions that I could give to people if they wanted to hear the full thing. So this was supposed to illustrate the complex feedbacks you get between the Atlantic circulation and the glaciers in Greenland, and so. The Atlantic circulation is melting the ice, the fresh water comes back into the Atlantic, and that's one of these processes that can drive us through climate tipping points. So just to, to uh, get towards the end of my talk, this is from the IPCC. It shows the air temperature, uh, the global temperature change in the last 2,000 years. Okay, and we really see how we're driving warmth in the recent period, and that's exceptional over those 2,000 years. And we also know that we're now in the warmest multi-century um, period in the last 100,000 years. So this kind of highlights that we're really forcing the climate through um, a change that has been unprecedented in the natural system. So this is what we're talking about, two possibilities. On the left-hand side of the plot, we have um, a continued warming of the climate, the pattern amplification I was talking about. So the Arctic is continuing to warm, but with more energy in the climate system. And that's what's supposed to be illustrated there on the left. But we can drive the climate through a tipping point, an abrupt tipping point, and it goes into a new state. And that new state might be a much colder Arctic. And it might be one that the Arctic finds very difficult to get out of in the future, because we know that even if we uh, stop the, the melting, it's possible that the climate remains in that much colder state. So to conclude this talk, abrupt climate change is observed many times in the climate record and is a serious scientific challenge to understand and predict. Abrupt climate change poses risks to the mitigation strategies we adopt because of its inherent unpredictability and because of the rates of change. And the uncertainties of hitting tipping points and the societal risks that they pose are such that we should mitigate climate change and do all that is possible to limit global warming. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, very uh, clear exposition of the unlikely but highly impactful event of a regime shift or a tipping point shift in the Atlantic Ocean and in the global ocean. Um, I, we are going to move now, I first have to give an apology, I'm going to apologize to um, Dr. Marilena Altmans and Dr. Maria Paz Cidicimo, who I did have pre-records for, from, and I was going to show now, and they were going to show you how we observe the Atlantic Ocean um, system. Unfortunately, due to technical hitches and lots of feedback, we're not going to show those but we will be able to make them available um, somehow to you. Anyway, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce a movie star onto stage, but actually he's also a physicist uh, and um, at a local university, Strathclyde University. So, Dave. Thanks very much. So, uh, I've got about four minutes to tell you a wee bit about light and life in the Arctic Ocean. Um, you've seen in the movie there, 
uh, how the Arctic Ocean looks during winter when we have the long periods of darkness. But uh, we went back up again later in the year and we, we, we saw scenes like this where you see the long summer day of six months of daylight. And this is, this is, this is the midnight sun shining on an ice-covered Arctic. And light has a hugely important role to play in driving uh, photosynthesis in the Arctic Ocean and it drives animal behaviour as well. And I'm interested in the light getting down actually into the ocean itself. So we have this huge seasonality uh, that's characteristic of po po polar regions in the, 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 the light cycle. And in terms of what actually gets into the, the, the ocean itself, it's all mediated by the presence or absence of sea ice and snow. So what I want to talk about very briefly is how that impacts on the Arctic food web. So here we have a really nice image of the, 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 the various trophic levels of the Arctic food web. You see it starts with uh, phytoplankton and ice algae at the base of the food web, and then everything else stems from that. We have zooplankton eating the phytoplankton, the zooplankton are then eaten by everything from the cod, the whales, the seabirds, and that goes up through the, the food chain to the iconic species of polar bears and humans as well. So the entire system is driven by the, that photosynthesis and those small microscopic plants support all of the animal life in the, in the ocean. So I want to look at two scenarios. In the first one, we have an ice-covered uh, ocean where we have sea ice on the sea surface. Now that makes the ocean a little bit darker and you might imagine that means you've got less plant growth. But what actually happens is that the ice provides a nice stable substrate for ice algae to form on the underside. And these ice algae are therefore able to bloom really early in the season and they provide really good nutritional content. So if you're a poor wee zooplankton that's struggling to make it through this long, dark Arctic winter. This is, this is the first new food source that you get, and it's really important for your life cycle that you can get access to this. In a situation where the, we, we see more melting and we end up with more open water, we're going to see production of uh, pelagic phytoplankton, and they will tend to bloom later because you don't have that ice cover anymore. You get wind mixing, which makes it uh, much harder to form stable water column to get blooms forming. So that means that the zooplankton will have to wait longer in order to get this first fresh meal. And the, the, the phytoplankton that are produced under these circumstances are typically less nutritious. So in many cases, this might be too little too late for hungry zooplankton that are, that are desperately waiting for this fresh source of, of nutrition. What you find is that the zooplankton have a, a life cycle that's really tuned into the timing and availability of this plant material. So we really, we, 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 we put them at jeopardy in, in a situation where the, the reliable ice algae early on in the season becomes less available. And whatever happens to that the zooplankton feeds all the way through this, this ecosystem. As we say, there are links from the zooplankton all the way up through the whales, the seals, up through the polar bears and the seabirds, up to, 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 to humans as well. So what happens uh, at, that, uh, at these early stages of the, of the food cycle has impacts right throughout the ecosystem. So Stuart has just been talking about the uncertainty that we have in, in what will happen to, to Arctic ecosystems in the future. Um, what we see here, when we think about life in the, in the Arctic Ocean, we think about these iconic species. And I guess the, the message I just want to, to, to get across is that polar bears, seals, walruses are ultimately dependent on the zooplankton, the phytoplankton, that comes down to the ice levels and the light levels. And in, a, in an uncertain future, we are working really hard to try and understand what the, the future holds for these species, but there are a huge number of, of outstanding uncertainties that means that, that, you know, despite the fact that we're just part of a, a real global effort to, to, to understand these feedback processes, there's still a lot of unknowns 
that, that, that we are working hard to understand. But a situation such as what uh, Stuart has described is, 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 is really a, a massive challenge to, to, to the survival of these kinds of species. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Um, finally, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. B. Burks from uh, Marine Scotland Science. And B is going to give, I think, you know, there's a huge impact. Uh, we've talked about will the Arctic warm or cool? You know, what does that mean for infrastructure, for fisheries, for flooding, for all these parts um, that the government have to worry about? Now, B is a, is a scientist in her own right, but she does work for Marine Scotland, and she is part of Scottish government. And I hope that B is going to be able to give us some perspective uh, on these issues from, a, from the Scottish government perspective, at any rate, but probably more widely. Thank you, B. Okay, whilst um, Heidi is giving me the signal that my slides are coming. Um, so my name is B Burks. I'm a scientist working for Scottish government. Um, in their marine directorate called Marine Scotland and I'm going to talk about um, how we advise policymakers to really try and deal with this uncertainty and I am hoping oh there they are okay great so knowledge to climate action and really I'm a knowledge translator working in government um, Stuart's already shown these, they're um, warming stripes. Um, they were made famous by um, the University of Reading and Ed Hawkins, and hopefully you'll have seen them around the conference already. And what these really highlight for me is at the top, we have the global warming stripes. So they really show the long-term trend of global warming due to um, human activities. In the middle, we have the Scottish air temperature, and you can see there's a lot more variability, but there's still an overarching um, warming trend. And in the bottom panel, we have the water temperatures of Atlantic water in Scottish waters, um, just offshore Glasgow here, so if you head into the open ocean. And it really shows that the ocean has a larger memory, and it has these um, great swings of very warm and very cold, um, or colder periods, relatively speaking. And that means that when we communicate to policymakers, we really have to highlight that just because temperatures are maybe more variable where they're based, it does not mean that the global warming signal is not important and that we shouldn't take, be taking climate action. So um, the panel on the left here shows a timeline of um, climate um, policies in recent uh, years. So it starts with um, 1988 when the first IPCC was established. And in 1990, the first assessment report was actually um, uh, published. But this timeline also shows there's latency in the system between establishing a scientific evidence base and then successfully communicating that into policy. So um, Scotland is one of the first nation, uh, subnational governments to recognize the climate emergency. And we're really committed to meeting a net zero target by 2045. But our first climate action, uh, climate change act was not until 2009. So that's a good few decades after the IPCC already established their first reporting cycle. And in the back of this is the panel on the right, which is the greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. And so you can see that despite an increasing evidence base, we've really um, lacked ability to take action and reduce our emissions successfully. And part of that is that we also need information at regional scales. We need to be able to communicate at a global level what's um, happening and the impacts in the Arctic are very important there, but also translate to our policy stakeholders and um, industry sectors what that means in the local environment. And so these are all warming stripes, but for different areas of Scottish waters. And you can see there's some coherence um, so the top panels, the top half is pretty much everything on the uh, west coast of Scotland and um, the bottom part is everything that's more into the North Sea. 
And so you can see that um, there are some communities between those, but there are also regional differences. And that means that the impacts on the ecosystem in these two regions is also somewhat different. And we need to be able to communicate that. And the IPCC has recognized that they need to be providing much more information at the regional level to support governments um, to make their decisions on adaptation. And as Stuart already highlighted, there's also uncertainty in the system. If there is Arctic cooling or cooling in the subpolar North Atlantic, what does that mean for um, our sectors? And it is not just the marine sectors necessarily that will be impacted. The bottom um, left two maps show what happens to rainfall in the UK under either smooth climate change or a sudden collapse of the AMOP. And what you can see is that there is a very strong drying, which means that arable farming is actually at risk. And so we need to communicate both with our own marine directorate, but also with policymakers in other um, areas of governments who are trying to um, adapt to climate change, um, the importance of the ocean. And as part of that, our project, uh, we have a project proposal currently on, um, under review with the European Commission to try and um, get information about the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation as soon as possible, ASAP, into policymakers' hands so they can really use that to inform decision making when it comes to the blue economy, so sectors like fisheries, aquaculture uh, and marine renewables, but also other areas of government. And that really means that we need to make um, predictions, which are from days to weeks, into climate projections. And in that intervening period, there's actually um, a good area of, um, on a decade scale, where we can um, use forecasting quite well as well. And I'll come to that in a minute. Against that backdrop of that timeline is also the governance structure, which goes from a daily parliamentary uh, meeting almost to um, elections on multi-year timescales. And um, oh, I've removed one slide, sorry. Um, what I was going to say is that the Atlantic is actually very, um, very predictable. The information we have from the Atlantic overturning circulation means that we can make predictions um, very well for um, Northern Europe, and um, we should really leverage that to inform policymakers. So with that, I'll show you a nice picture off of Mull, which is just one of the islands here um, close to Glasgow. And thank you very much. Thanks, B. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It's um, really uh, informative, I think, to see, you know, we're, we are all, I think, familiar with the climate stripes for the globe. But I think when you drill down to the regional level, we see some very, very different patterns. And again, that's very much part of the theme we're trying to uh, expose today about these very different, very divergent potential scenarios. Great, well, thanks speakers. Um, I apologize again for uh, those whose pre-records we were unable to show. We're gonna have a Q&A now. So whilst we get the panelists up on stage, including Mike, <laughs> um, the, um, Think about your questions so i'll take questions from the audience um i've got some questions that have come in uh through social media over the last uh week or so i'm i'm wondering whether we are able to have marilena join us um yeah so my uh yep dr marilena altman's who is um oceanographer at the national oceanography center in uh, southampton um and apologies we couldn't show her um, short uh, clip, but I can in 30 seconds uh, perhaps try to summarize what we all require to do is to have some level of prediction of uh, our um, climate system. And without measuring it, there is no way we can predict it. And Marilena and Maria Paz, we're going to show to you the um, observing systems right across the Atlantic Ocean, multinational, um, uh, multi year efforts that uh, take place to measure. And there's Marilena there. Thank you, Marilena, and apologies for uh, the technicals. No problem, can you, hi. Can we hear you? Great. We're good to go, we're good to go. Right. I'm actually gonna start with a question for you, Marilena, because <laughs> we couldn't play your, uh, your piece. Um, 
So I did have a question came in uh, yesterday. Yeah, so someone was asking whether we can already see a slowdown or can we see a change in the Atlantic heat supply or the heat uh, engine to the Arctic? Uh, is that already evident in the observations? Oh, this is a really good question. Yeah, so the, um, the problem with the AMOC is, or with observing the AMOC, this Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation that transports heat northward, is that it varies on a range of timescales, and particularly on decayal timescales. So it has periods of, we see periods, alternating periods of warm, warm phases of the North Atlantic and cold phases of the subpolar North Atlantic. And those occurred naturally in the past. So we have um, a natural cycle of, of AMOC variability, and that has been um, driven in the past by um, freshwater releases from the Arctic. So we actually have also natural freshwater releases from the Arctic, and they modulate this um, global overturning, or at least the, the North Atlantic part of the, of the overturning circulation. And um, in the past, now on this um, natural cycle, we have increased melting, so increased freshwater influence uh, from melting, and this is an additional effect on this circulation. But it's um, it's it, it's a different effect. So we can have more freshwater either because of more melting or because so we have more freshwater in the currents, or we can have a change of the currents. And this change of the currents, this is a natural cycle, and this change of freshwater in the currents is an additional effect that. Um, that is due to um, due to the global warming, and this has not led to a. Uh, so we don't have a trend on top of a natural cycle, but the trend has interfered with this natural cycle, and um, the natural cycle, the Nessus, um, natural freshwater release, has um, buffered some of the influences that we have seen from increased melting. So this makes it really hard to detect influence. But one of the things it has done, it has led to an increase in the frequency and the amplitude of this of the cycle. So we see um, basically more extremes in shorter periods of time. So this is an effect that that we are currently already seeing. But it's hard to say um, whether this is um, how how this will continue. And it's also still um, yeah there are um, a lot of different observational programs. We're still working on this and. It's um, yeah, so it's difficult to say if it has already slowed down, but um, this may also not be the important question because um, if we have an increase in, in the cycle itself, this already leads to a lot of effects on, on European climate and also other parts of the world. Great, thank you, Marilena. Um, do we have any questions here? We are, do you, yeah, we'll, we'll take this question first, and then we have another question here. I have two questions, if you don't mind. My, my first is for, for Dr. McKee about the under ice uh, algae. So if it, th there's good evidence that sea ice is thinning and, and maybe even the snow depth is, is decreasing. So there's probably more light making it to the base of the, the ice, the, the ice ocean interface. D do the algae like that? Like I've seen pictures of them and they're often quite brown. Are they, are they photosynthesizers? So are they, are they actually, are they doing better where they exist? Although obviously the ice is retreating, so they're there's less coverage, but do they, are they enjoying sea ice thinning? They may do for a, a short period, and then when the ice goes, then, then their habitat is effectively gone with it. And at that stage, you've flipped into that, that, that different stage. So I think there was a, a, there's a, there's a kind of general situation of who's going to be winners and who's going to be losers. It, it's very hard to, to, to say, you know, on, it varies on different time scales. And I think one of the things that we're, we're, we're hearing here is that as you put the system into periods of rapid changes, you're, you're, you're putting stresses on all of those different layers, and it's very hard to know what the what the what the, you know. Answering that question is going to depend on what time scale you're thinking of. Um, it's, it's a hard one. Because, sorry, uh, I'd like to move to the next question. I'll come back to you if we don't have another one. Uh, so, please. Uh, no, you need. To Okay, uh, this is to um, B and Stuart. It's about the warming stripes. You can see a different structure to the west and east of uh, Scotland, much simpler response to the east. Is that because of a North Atlantic current imprint or is it atmospherically um, blocking, uh, atmospheric vari variability imprinting itself on there? 
So the answer I think there is probably that the North Sea responds very differently. It's a shallow sea and it's much more atmospherically influenced. So we are seeing a great, a stronger relationship, I think, in the North Sea to the atmospheric signal than we are on the west of Scotland, which is very much dominated by that Atlantic signal. I don't know, Stuart, if you would like to add anything. No? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I am being given the time is up signal from the back desk. So um, I think we can carry on this discussion. Uh, we are all here, uh, so please come and talk to us afterwards online. If there's a way to post questions, please do, uh, and we'll do our best to answer them. I just want to thank everyone, thank the speakers, and um, thank you for um, thank you to Michael for the film. And I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it gave you a, a, a piece of peace or, uh, peace within the the chaos chaos of COP26 uh, blue zone, which I can assure you, if you're here, is it's quite chaotic, um, but it's but it's wonderful. And I hope we've given you some sense of the complexity of the. North Atlantic and how there are some very, very different potential outcomes for the Arctic. And um, so it's not necessarily gonna get warmer uh, and the uncertainty is huge and we need to continue to observe and predict if we're gonna get anywhere near understanding if and when we might reach such a tipping point. Thank you everyone, um, goodbye.